Uh, it is next my pleasure to introduce a friend and colleague, Dr. David Zavieja, who is actually the chair of the Scientific and Medical Advisory Committee of LEARN, and he will talk to us about basic concepts of anatomy and physiology in the lymphatics. Thanks, Dan. I'd like to thank the organizers of the meeting and the session. I'd certainly like to thank Kathy for the inspiring words. Um, and I get the opportunity to give you all a very brief primer of um, uh, lymphatic basic biology, particularly focusing on the physiology and touching a little on, a, on anatomy. And uh, an alternate title would be what you didn't get in medical school in 10 minutes. So, Lymphatic system... Um, We've been calling it the immunovascular network to kind of differentiate it from the blood vascular network because it has specific tasks and we believe may be purposely designed to really accomplish that particular task. But it's a network of blinded and lymphatic capillaries, pre-collectors, lymph ducts, and lymphoid organs such as tonsils, pyre, patch, and nodes. It's a one-way transport system that takes things from the interstitial spaces collects it into the lymphatic capillaries, processes it through the pre-collectors, and then into the muscularized collectors. And at this point, they become valved, whereas in the capillary beds, they normally are not. And then eventually, it's much more complicated, of course, than these schematics, but an anastomosis with lots and lots of other vessels and forms an afferent lymphatic trunk. Magical things happen in the node, sometimes good, sometimes bad. Um, and eventually, you get post-nodal lymphatics that exit there, will likely join a number of other lymph nodes and lymphatics along the way, and eventually the processed lymph and interstitial fluid and containing all these various signals, some of your parenchymal tissues, goes back to the venous circulation of the blood, emptying the fluid, and I hope to impress on you lots of other things that come from the interstitium back into the blood. So what are the physiological roles of the lymphatic system? First and foremost, we always think about fluid and macromolecular homeostasis. It's the means by which most of the fluid that exits the blood capillaries and venous end of the circulation gets back into the circulation going through this pathway. Um, many of you, and long ago I used to teach this to the, the medical students, thought that a lot of fluid gets taken back up into the venous end of the circulation. That is certainly true in some organs under some, some conditions, but the majority of that, and typically it's anywhere between three and five liters of lymph a day for most people, actually get taken back up into the lymph system. Second one is, so it's important for edema and prevention and resolution. Second one is lipid absorption in the gut. So all the lipids you ate this morning and the majority of what you ate will be eating later on or being collected in through the, <coughs> excuse me, the specialized lymphatics or lacteals in the intestine. They're carried from there in the form of chylomicrons all the way through this vascular system back to the blood. And so it's critical for transport. But what we're learning now is it's not just transport, that in fact the lymphatics interact with adipocytes all along, particularly along this path, to determine lipid metabolism. Um, it's an area of intense uh, investigation scientifically. Last, but certainly not least, is that the fact that the lymphatic system is the predominant route in the body for the trafficking of cells antigens, cytokines, and other immune-relevant agents from the tissue spaces to, to the nodes and then from the nodes back to the blood. So it provides, what I hope to impress on you, it provides the information path that takes things from your patient's parenchymal tissues, carries that to the nodes, and then the nodes do their work, and then what exits the lymph is not the same as what enters it, and that provides you responses to inflammation and responses for the immune system. So how do you fulfill these? Well, first you have to grow and maintain this network of lymphatic vessels that connects interstitial spaces with the nose and great veins in the neck. You learn this embryologically. This you probably did learn a bit about in medical school. And then we know that, in fact, it embryologically develops in part from the venous circulation, separates off early and differentiates itself and actually maintains itself separate under normal conditions for the rest of your life. Then you have to form lymph from the interstitial fluid. Carry that and molecules and formed elements within, carried by the lymph fluid itself through this whole network in order to accomplish the goals that we've already described. And lastly, you transport that lymph and carry it from where it gets formed. And we don't really quite understand the mechanisms by which interstitial fluid leaves the interstitium and becomes lymph proper by crossing the lymphatic capillary endothelium. It's another area of intense investigation. Once you get it there, you have to move it. And what I hope to show you is that you all are very, very acutely aware of the issues that you have in the venous circulation in terms of pressure gradients and uh, the problem in driving normal venous blood flow. The lymphatics are actually much more problematic. 
Um, and so, to take a, and we'll come back to that in just a minute. To take a back, step back to limb formation, the current I- idea, and though this still relies on a lot of extra uh, proof, is that starling forces that regulate fluid coming out of the blood circulation in the interstitium very similarly alter what goes into the lymphatics and lymph formation. What's not depicted very well here is that the difference between lymphatic capillaries and blood capillaries is you actually have large gaps between the lymphatic endothelium or the primary flap valves where these valves can open and close under different hydrodynamic conditions in the tissue. What that means is that the proteins inside and outside lymph, uh, the lymphatic endothelial wall, are essentially identical. So oncotic forces don't play a role. Instead, it's the hydrostatic pressure gradients that play a role. Once you get it there, you have the additional problem of having it move from the lymphatic capillary, say in my toe or in my fingernail, um, or fing- fingertip, sorry, from there through the, sorry, through the whole lymphatic network back to the central venous blood. We always, many of us use the phrase lymph drainage. And sometimes it's correct, many times it's not. Because why is it not correct? Because drainage implies it's a passive gradient, that lymph is simply flowing down like a sewer system. And in fact, what you know, and this is an old, old work from a Hungarian group in the um, 60s that actually did a very careful analysis of different lymphatic beds and measured pressures. And we've added a little bit to it, but the bottom line is this. You've got to move it from here, where it's interstitial fluid, through these various lymphatic trees and eventually empty it into here. And what you notice is that pressure gradients don't provide that passive movement. The pressures are in the wrong direction. So lymph will not just simply flow or drain downhill. Um, You have to impart energy to get it to go from here all the way through the network to there. And additionally, you have the confounding factor of hydrostatic pressure and gravitational forces. Lymphatics are even more compliant, thinner walled, and have lower pressures than the venous circulation. You all know, are acutely aware of the problems that hydrostatic pressures cause in venous transport. In lymphatics, it's much more significant. So how do you overcome these things? Well, the principal way that is used in mammals, including humans, is that you use a network of pumps and valves. And so the lymphatics Um, even more than the venous circulation, is highly valved vascular system. In this case, you have valves, the primary ones we talked about in between the lymphatic endothelial cells in the capillaries, as well as the secondary ones are more akin to the venous valves that you're familiar with. Those are luminal valves that help minimize or or at least prevent um, backflow. In addition, you have to impart energy to move this uphill, literally. And you can use, the lymphatic system uses pumps that are both intrinsic and extrinsic forces. Similar to what you talk about in the venous circulation, you can have skeletal muscle pumps that drive not only venous blood flow but also lymph flow. And you can have intrinsic pumps, like you'll see in just a minute. That means that the forces generated by those intrinsic pumps rely and reside within the lymphatic vessel itself. Let's quick take a, a, an, an image, image of one of these secondary lymph valves. So this is a very small vessel. It's actually from a rat. It's about 100 microns or so in diameter, so a little bit, small, a little bit larger than one of your hairs. And you can see the valve leaflets right here. You can see the endothelial bumps. And it's those valves that open and close throughout these various contractile cycles to drive lymph flow. Um, The extrinsic pump, I'm not going to talk a lot more about, but that relies on external forces, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, breathing, GI peristalsis. All of those tissues compress and relax lymphatics, and the way lymphatic capillaries are specially tied to the matrix, what this works is like a primer bulb that you might use to move if you're stealing gas from your neighbor's car. Um, You have a primer valve that compresses and decompresses with the right valves, you can move things uphill. This is an example of what the unique characteristic of the lymphatics is the intrinsic pumping. This is a in situ vessel that's again about the size of a human hair in the mesentery. This is a rat. You can see the lymphatic contracting, relaxing. This is real time, it's not sped up. You don't see the valves in this particular one, but it's this that drives lymph flow. Once it exits the gut wall, you then have to propel it all the way to the node, and it's this activity that drives it. And so in essence, the lymphatic vessels act, which are muscularized here, act as both a conduit and a heart. You can see the immune cells flying by. Oops, okay, this is another example of a similar vessel, but this one we've taken out, dissected out very carefully, cannulated, pressurized, and you can see the lymphatic contractions, and here are the valve leaflets as it opens and closes, and it's that activity that drives the intrinsic lymph pump. 
So what are the regulators of this? Well, there's many of them, and what we spend a lot of our time is looking at the intrinsic regulators due to physical factors, so pressure and stretch will influence this. Shear mechanisms acting through nitric oxide and other similar activities will, will alter it. And then there are chemical factors released by lymphatic cells, as well as extrinsic factors. These vessels are innervated, they have adrenergic, cholinergic, and particularly peptidergic innervation that all alter their function, as well as circulating chemical factors. How do you get this activity? So you have this vessel that actually acts as both a vessel and a heart. Well, the unique characteristics of the lymphatic muscle is that it has characteristics of both cardiac muscle and smooth muscle like you see in blood vessels and in the gut. So it's a unique clues of this mixture of different striated and smooth muscle components. And it has pacemaker activity, calcium relation uh, releases that activate this. And all of those control those tonic activities like you would see in a vein or in an arterial, where you have a tonic activation of tones, low constant contained constriction, and then you have this fast phasic pumping activities that drive that activity as well. So the last thing I must spend just a, a minute on or so is to impress on you that in addition to the roles that you know about from the blood in driving lymph flow, the other thing it does is really carries important inflammatory and immune signals from the interstitium to the nodes and eventually back up through the thoracic duct and into the vein. And what comes in is not the same as what goes out. So if you look at efferent and afferent lymph, they're actually quite different. They have lots of similarities, but what they differ in is their immune signals. So they carry antigens, self and foreign, they carry cytokines, and as well as the immune cells. And their reaction is, is what is important in inflammation and actually in immune function. Not only do they carry it, but they process it. So this is a, one of, near my last slides, that shows what these vessels look like. Some of the similar vessels you've seen in the in situ videos, we've taken them out and stained them for an antigen presenting cell protein. And so this is a, a population, very significant population of immune cells that reside in the wall of the prenatal lymphatic. They sense what's coming by in lymph, they respond to it, they change their transport, and they change their characteristics and respond secreting other things back into that lymph to prepare the node for what's to come, whether it's self-recognition and uh, the prevention of autoimmunity or if it's foreign antibody recognition in response to an infectious agent. And these are just some immunohistochemistry to show you that they actually reside in the wall, not in the lumen. So, a long, long, long summary here, but I'm going to skip right to the end since I'm running late. That the, when lymphatic function fails, fluid macromolecules in immune cells, as well as other immune signals, become trapped in the affected interstitium. Thus, lymphatic dysfunction produces a chronic inflammatory state in the affected tissues. And it's that chronic inflammatory state that can be part of the process that drives this in, on in a very uh, negative feedback way that makes the, the, the disease worse. And addressing both the fluid and other inflammatory components trapped in the tissues is necessary for the resolution of the edema and the chronic inflammation. And I'll stop there because I'm already over. And these are the folks that help do some of this work here. Thank you. Thank you.